Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Designing for Inclusivity, Safeguarding Culture and Heritage. My name is Jerrica from Design Singapore Council, and I will be your event MC and moderator for today. This session is brought to you by Design Singapore Council, the National Agency for Design in Singapore, supported by the National Heritage Board, the custodian of Singapore's heritage. It is also supported by the National Design Centre, and in August and September, the centre will be exploring events with a thematic focus on Singapore, our home. This webinar is part of a series of engagement and sharing sessions under the Good Design Research Initiative, which aims to help designers and design enterprises in Singapore find their unique value proposition in designing for impact through research, experimentation, or collaborating with a network of knowledge partners. Information on the Good Design Research Initiative will be shared with you during the course of this session. We are honoured to have the National Heritage Board with us today and various distinguished speakers who will be contributing to today's session. We hope to bring you on an inspiring journey exploring how each of us can contribute and play a part to embody and retain our local heritage. Before we proceed, I would like to highlight a few housekeeping rules. Should you encounter any technical issues, please reach out to our crew through the Zoom chat function. We ask for your patience and understanding should conditions be less than perfect. During this webinar, your audio will be on mute. However, your questions are welcome at any point in time. Just direct them to us under the Zoom Q&A function. When posting a question, please state your name and company and if you have a specific speaker whom you'd like to respond to your question. Finally, please be informed that this session will be recorded. Now, please allow me to introduce the speakers and this afternoon's program. Starting off, my colleague Hui Mei from the Design Singapore Council will be joining us to share an overview of the Good Design Research Initiative. Next, we have Mr. Yo Kirk Siang, Director of the Heritage Research and Assessment Division at the National Heritage Board. Mr. Yeo currently leads the research, documentation, and commemoration of Singapore's tangible and intangible cultural heritage. This includes the development of a master plan that outlines the strategy for Singapore's heritage sector. Following which, we have Mr. Raymond Wong, Fashion and Boutique Director of Wuma Kim Chu, who will be speaking on Anonya Kambaya, promoting and safeguarding the timeless beauty. Mr. Wong is a third generation Chinese Peranakan, and today he is one of the last few kabaya makers in Singapore. Mr. Wong also lectures part time at LaSalle College of the Arts. Last but not least, we have Mrs. Tan from Taokong Pottery Jungle. Her presentation topic will be on keeping the fire alive. Alongside her husband and niece, Mrs. Tan manages Taokong, a family business that owns and operates one of the two last remaining dragon cleans in Singapore. In addition, Tao Kuang hosts a wide range of outreach programs and community initiatives that aims to educate the public on the wood firing pottery process. In doing so, they have transformed into a hub for a community of local clay artists. Tao Kuang was also recently awarded the inaugural Stewards of Singapore Intangible Cultural Heritage Award by the National Heritage Board. Without further ado, I will now hand you over to Hui Mei, who will be giving you a quick introduction to the Good Design Research Initiative. Hui Mei, please. Thank you, Jerrica, for the quick introduction, and thank you all for taking the time to join us today. So I'm not sure how many of you may have heard of the Good Design Research Initiative before, and so I would like to take this opportunity to share with you a little bit more on the background of this initiative. So first, I'll be sharing on why good design research is important, and then secondly, on the key elements of the initiative. So its importance in today's context was very apparent when we conducted our groundwork in close consultation with designers and design enterprises. We interviewed over 40 of them, with most of them recognizing that designing for impact, which is also what most will recognize as good design, that will help them shape their unique value proposition and stand out in the global marketplace. And then on the demand side, there has always been a recognition of the role that design can play in mitigating the world's complex issues. For example, sustainability, as well as inclusivity and diversity. The role that design can play is especially apparent in this COVID pandemic and the design innovation that we need right now goes beyond simply improving the user experiences for retail and F&B but also requires 
deep research. So clearly, there is a need for deep research that is fundamental to good design. However, good design research requires two key elements. Firstly, it requires significant investment. And secondly, a strong network that is not always possible with smaller design firms. And therefore, our Good Design Research Initiative, um, the Council plans to bridge these two resource gaps. So firstly, the Good Design Research Initiative aims to help build a strong network and ecosystem to foster multidisciplinary collaborations that are necessary for design impact projects. We are hoping to achieve these through the webinar, as well as the subsequent sharing and engagement sessions. The second part of the Good Design Research Initiative aims to support exploratory projects through open calls. And this support includes sponsorship, publicity support, as well as mentorship. So through this through two-pronged approach, um, the Good Design Research Initiative encourages designers to develop their unique value proposition. In particular, we are looking at projects that seeks to support, uh, sorry, in particular, we are looking at projects that focuses on deep explorations and research into these three key tracks. You have your identity and culture, systems and processes, and new technologies. We are also focusing on research projects with a focus on design impact. So I hope this brief overview gives you a rough idea of what the Good Design Research Initiative is all about. And if you would like to find out more information, please scan the QR code on the bottom right of the slide. And now I'll pass the time back to Jerrica. Thank you, Huimi. You will now invite Mr. Yeo Kirk Xiang from the National Heritage Board, who will be sharing with you more about what exactly is intangible cultural heritage and an overview of the traditional craftsmanship landscape in Singapore. Mr. Yeo, please. Thank you, Jerrica, and thank you to Design Singapore for inviting me to share today's presentation. My presentation is on the intangible cultural heritage and traditional craftsmanship in Singapore. So a bit about um, NHB where I work in. Um, we are a statutory board under the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth, and our mission is to preserve and celebrate the heritage of our diverse communities. And we do this through the promotion and safeguarding of different forms of heritage. And heritage will include uh, museum artifacts, um, historic buildings, as well as intangible cultural heritage. So what is this uh, tangible and intangible cultural heritage that I just mentioned? Well, tangible is really um, talking about the physical aspects, you know, the artifacts, it could be the historic buildings, it could even be the documents that tell our history. Uh, on the other hand, we have intangible cultural heritage. So these are the practices, the knowledge, the craft skills that are handed down from generation to generation and evolves over time uh, as people innovate and change their practices. So this evolution is why we also call these forms of heritage uh, as living heritage. So in, as part of NHB's work, we tried to create a what we call an inventory of intangible cultural heritage. Uh, and this can be found on our website as shown here. And intangible cultural heritage can take many forms. They could be festivals, they could be, they could be our traditional performing arts, craft skills, and also our food heritage that we enjoy. Uh, just some examples of the different uh, ICH that may be found in Singapore. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the um, festivals such as Chinese New Year, Deepabali, Hari Raya. Uh, there are also more other religious um, festivals. They are less known, for example, the Nine Emperor Gods Festival. Uh, various forms of traditional arts like uh, Indian dance or art forms like the Rangoli. Traditional Malay medicine and also traditional theatre such as the Wayang Peranakan from the Peranakan community. Crafts, traditional craft skills is a major part of our cultural heritage. And these are sort of the hand skills, the artisan uh, knowledge that is passed down from one generation to the next. Uh, they are often a source of livelihoods for our practitioners because they, it's part of their business. And it's also a reflection of the culture and creativity of the communities and individuals. So the pictures here show uh, Madam Lee, for example, repairing the rattan furniture and Mr. Wong who handmade this uh, Fuk Cho 
uh, traditional lanterns. And there are many more that traditional um, crafts that can still be found in Singapore, like the making of joysticks, making of uh, traditional Indian gold jewelry, uh, Chongsam tailoring, kabi, kabadi making. And later on, we also have uh, Mrs. Tan and Raymond sharing on their respective craft skills. Um, just some more examples to share, and we should be go into depth a little bit more. Uh, for example, we have a uh, ketupat weaving here in the slides. Uh, it's a form of traditional crafts because it's really associated with the Malay community in Singapore. Uh, and it's of course associated with the food that um, the, our Malay uh, our counterparts uh, enjoy during Hari Raya. Uh, not only food, but also there are ketupat pouches that are weaved into you know, colorful ribbons as part of the decorations uh, during the festive periods. And it's a uh, kind of family activity where the children, the younger generation, learn from their elders on how to make and weave it. Just now I mentioned Mr. Wong, uh, who makes traditional Chinese lanterns. So these are the traditional lanterns. They are handmade and uh, hung outside, uh, traditionally outside homes, uh, temples and clan associations. Um, he has tried to innovate. I think traditional uh, craftsmanship can also involve innovation. For example, he uses tin aluminum rods uh, to produce uh, his traditional Chinese lanterns. And he also uses different dyes to show some, some of the more traditional uh, and auspicious characters, but also painting the lanterns with more contemporary motifs, such as orchids, and even the SG-50, we celebrated it a couple of years ago. Uh, another example is a Chinese signboard carving. Um, so contemporary signboards, which are manufactured, of course, is an evolution. And traditionally, these signboards are carved by hand. So could there be some kind of loss with um, replacing of machines? And I think this uh, practitioner, Mr. Yong, does feel that way that, you know, a signboard that's made by machine is not as beautiful and lacks um, texture and personality. So when we are trying to modernize um, our traditional crafts, I think it's also important that we see how this modernization and and contemporary design can value add to the process while retaining some of the essential essence and values that our traditional crafts contain. There are many challenges facing traditional crafts in Singapore. Uh, one is the economic sustainability of the trades. Um, there is kind of a general lack of the value that such uh, crafts can bring to the broader economy or even the spotlight on the livelihoods of our practitioners. Of course, our practitioners also face stiff competition, especially competition with uh, cheaper mass-produced imports. Uh, so this makes the economic sustainability quite challenging. The next point I would like to make is how do we make sure that the knowledge continues on passing down from generation to generation, just like how our past forefathers passed down our traditional knowledge to the current generation. One challenge that we often hear is the lack of skilled successors uh, who are keen to take on um, the craft. And I think it's also linked to this important point about how do we keep things relevant for the younger generations. It can be quite challenging to attract our younger generation to be part of this uh, traditional craftsman uh, industry, given um, you know, typical perceptions could, could range from such crafts being very laborious, unprofitable, or some may even deem it as lacking in prestige. Um, on our part, we try to safeguard and promote intangible cultural heritage through an award that we give out, give out, given out this year. It's titled the Stewards of Intangible Cultural Heritage Award, and with it comes a grant. Uh, it's our attempt to try to recognize and support our uh, cultural heritage practitioners who have made significant contributions and for their passion in trying to sustain and transmit their intangible cultural heritage. So these are just pictures of Tao Kuang Pottery Jungle. Uh, I'll leave uh, Mrs. Tan later on in the presentation to share more about her crafts. But I think beyond the award, I think my colleagues and I, we are looking at um, other ways on how do we uh, safeguard our heritage. Um, can our traditional practices carry on in today's digital world? And how can uh, traditional craftsmanship and modernity come together? Can they, are they mutually exclusive? Or can there be a happy marriage of heritage and design? So my next few slides will touch on some examples where 
um, traditional craftsmen have tried to work together with um, designers to come up with uh, more innovative uh, products and reimagining uh, our traditional crafts. Here's a local example by Se Tian Hin, which is a 124-year-old Taoist effigy making shop located in Chinatown. So the shop launched the uh, international design competition, challenging designers to reimagine the wooden statue of the monkey god and how it can be reimagined to suit a, a wider audience and whether it can be recreated into not just a religious artifact, but possibly a work of art that while maintaining the use of the traditional techniques they are used to make them. Uh, in 2019, there was also a project by the Art Link to introduce tradition, uh, Japanese craft skills to new audiences. So under this project, there were 12 craft makers from Japan that were paired up with Singapore designers to co-create a series of furniture and lifestyle products while using the traditional Japanese craftsmanship. In Hong Kong, they have also tried to do something similar. There is a non-profit organization in Hong Kong called Crafts on Peel, and they've tried to um, sort of match make traditional craftsmen with artists through an artisan in residence program. And this is coupled with an exhibition titled Crafts Interwoven, Past and Present. So under this program in Hong Kong, what they've done is to try to pair up contemporary artists with local traditional craftsmanship to explore how um, our traditional crafts can be reinterpreted into artistic um, rendering. Um, so, so here are some examples. What, here's a picture of a council table that's handmade uh, using bamboo uh, without any glue or nails. And this design is actually inspired by the making of the traditional Chinese handcrafted bird cages. Uh, such bird cages used to be a common sight in Hong Kong tea houses of the past. Uh, still on the Hong Kong initiative, uh, is, here's an example in the picture of a chandelier. And it's actually designed and made using a traditional bamboo steamer, which uh, many of you will be familiar when you, if you are eating dim sum. Um, so what they did is to get the traditional craftsmen to work on the bamboo, uh, to craft it. Uh, so the bamboo pieces are still uh, made steam, softened, carved, using a traditional techniques. But of course here, they are, they, are not, they are using it to make a light piece. So in India, there's also similar examples that can be found. Here's a collaboration that we found involving a philanthropy foundation, Be Open, together with the Fashion Design Council of India uh, and various Indian lifestyle brands, together working together with traditional craftsmen. So they tried to co-create uh, traditional crafts, um, and to exhibit as well as so sell off the products so that the, this also provides a form of livelihood both for the designers as well as the traditional craftsmen who are involved in the process. So here are some uh, examples. Here, here's one from a lighting installation that's inspired by the local uh, traditional glass blowers from Northern India. So the glass blowers uh, created this piece in the shape of a peacock which also uh, closely associated with the India's heritage. So the feathers here, for example, are made using 48 uh, glass stems uh, created by the traditional glass blowers. Um, here's a collaboration between uh, designers and the stone cutters from Tamil Nadu. So the stone cutters were, were brought in to produce uh, flooring strips from granite as well as table surfaces for the installation. So all these are handmade by the stonemasons using uh, their um, paste grinding stones. I've just shared a few examples of um, you know, the marriage of design with traditional crafts, but I think we also have to be mindful of there could be some potential sensitivities uh, between getting inspiration, but um, on a more negative side, it could be accused of being a cultural appropriation a uh, concept that is highly uh, sensitive, especially in Western countries. So here, uh, the picture shows some examples. The picture on the left is one from a Toronto gallery where an artist uh, mentioned that she was inspired by uh, the indigenous art forms. Uh, and from there, she created uh, art that is so-called based and inspired by this indigenous art. But I think it raises concern from the indigenous people there. And it was forced to cancel the, the art show because of it. And picture on the left is one of issue 
um, that is sometimes seen in the fashion scene. So here's an example where a London-based fashion label had to apologize to the Canadian descendants for uh, appropriating um, a design that was used in a traditional outfit and they had adapted it to a fashion runway design here. So I think it's important that um, we, when we are working with traditional craftsmen, we also have to find a way of, of how do we uh, give the due recognition and respect for the traditional crafts and traditional heritage that is associated with it. Uh, coming back to Singapore, I think it's, uh, we're hoping to see whether heritage can play an important role in design. Uh, we do see um, more interest in heritage, especially in the last few years, and potentially this could uh, give rise to perhaps more interest in handmade artisanal products that are inspired by heritage. Uh, we do see a growing demand in the market in Singapore as well as abroad for designs that embody uh, distinct cultural identities and characteristics. And we also see this as a way to bring about innovation and, uh, to our traditional crafts in a meaningful way. Uh, how do we do it in a balanced way that it's uh, while we come up with new designs, but at the same time, uh, respect, respecting the traditions and the culture of the people. Uh, and of course, um, could there be designs that are inspired, uh, are inspired by our Singapore culture heritage? I think that's also quite meaningful as we um, find ways to preserve and safeguard our heritage. So at NHB, I think what we're trying to do is to run a small pilot. Uh, we're hoping to raise uh, public awareness and appreciation for our local craftsmen. One idea that we had was could we pair, uh, just like the international examples we, I presented, could we pair traditional craft practitioners together with our designers to, for, for a partnership? Um, this could help um, our traditional crafts people uh, who are willing to innovate, but perhaps they don't know how to or, or don't have the networks to do so. And pairing them up with uh, designers who are willing to, to learn a bit about uh, traditional crafts and to find ways to incorporate it into newer designs. So this is still a very much a preliminary idea, but if you have any, any thoughts, uh, do feel free to contact my colleagues who I've mentioned in this uh, slide here. So in conclusion, uh, as I'm, my presentation has highlighted, there are still many traditional crafts that remain in Singapore and they are form an important part of our culture and living heritage. Of course, there is un undeniably some challenge in, in ensuring that they continue to pass on to the next generation. And we want to see how, um, as we have observed in other countries, how perhaps some experimentation, some modernizing, and some more contemporary take on traditional crafts could help us to find a way to evolve and keep our cultural heritage alive. Perhaps through new designs, they are also unique and stand out from the, good, the standardized or industrial products that we often see on the market. And lastly, I also mentioned that this, while we want to modernize and experiment, I think it's also important that we not forget the cultural values associated with the crafts and the passion and dedication of our practitioners as well. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And this ends my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Yeo, for bringing us to the insightful presentation. Now, if there are any questions that you might have about the presentation, please send them via the Zoom Q&A module, and we will bring them up for discussion later on during the Q&A. Now, let's take half a minute here to hear from you about your opinions on cultural heritage. A poll should now appear on your screens with the question, should cultural heritage be allowed to vanish on its own over time? Um, let us know what you think. Okay, we will now end the poll. Well, I'm very glad to see that 94% of you think that cultural heritage should not be allowed to vanish over time. So I think across the next two presentations, our practitioners will be sharing with us on what they have done to safeguard the transmission of their craft and to ensure that it can be carried on for generations to come. Next up, we have Mr. Raymond Wong from Wuma Kim Chu, who will be sharing with us more about the Nonya Kabaya. Mr. Wong, please. Hi, I'm Raymond Wong here, and um, I'm the owner of Roma Kim Chu. And I, I would like to thank um, Design Singapore and NHP for giving this valuable chance to actually do this session with you all. So I uh, will go on to the next slide, please. 
Uh, next, please. Thank you. So um, this is a statement by Carl Sagan many years back when I first saw this statement. Uh, it inspires me a lot when it comes to designing my work. And I always feel that there's a need to know and understand um, the historical part of our culture and, and understand how can we innovate and create something out of it for our present and our future. And by understanding the, the historical part of it, uh, it also protects ourselves from cultural appropriation because many a times when people accuse of being appropriating other people's culture, uh, it always happens the case whereby they do not understand the cultural significance about it and they try to adulterate it to a point that uh, it is not respectable to the other communities. So understanding the history the, and it's really very important to when I do my own work. So go on to the next slide. So what is Pranakan culture? Pranakan culture actually fascinate, fascinates me a lot because it's a lifestyle culture born from acculturation within the major cities in Southeast Asia. And back then, most of the women folk around um, Malay archipelago and Indonesia would wear this conservative dress code as it was a popular fashion back then in that era. And this, and to the next slide, please. And as I mentioned, the sarong kebaya is actually a folk fashion. And this folk fashion comprises three main parts, which is basically the uh, embroidered top, which we know as the nonya kebaya, the batik sarong, the krongsang, and the beaded shoes. So this is considered a slow fashion because every part of the ensemble, it takes time to complete. For instance, for the beaded shoes itself, like a pair of beaded slipper like this, um, it, done with the old check beads, no one can imagine that it requires at least about 10,000 beads. And it can take our artisans about six to eight weeks to complete. So such is a very good example of um, what is slow fashion all about. Okay, next. So um, in 2004, when I first started out doing my business, it's a niche business, so it can be quite difficult. And there were quite a number of um, issues that I faced. First would be the lack of social environment. Uh, we noticed that a lot of young people find no relevance of the traditional folk fashion um, to their lifestyle. They don't feel a sense of belonging and pride wearing the clothes. And they always see it as an old costume and it's only worn by the older generation or they would always fear wearing the kabaya because they are afraid of people speaking Baba Patua to them. So um, the second one would be the lack of understanding and appreciation of the folk fashion. So a lot of young generation do not understand how hard business owners like ourselves are trying to maintain our, consume, our customer base here. Especially in times like today, we actually face a lot of competition from fast fashion. Uh, why is that so? Because fast fashion produce clothes really very fast and the pricing are always mostly quite affordable. So a lot of young people today, they actually find there's no need for customization. And, in, and when it comes to practicality part, they actually find that, oh, I only wear the kabaya for only formal occasions and that's it, maybe once in my whole lifetime. It's not like in the past, um, the, pre the older communities would actually wear it as a daily wear. And lastly, evolution of the folk fashion. Um, when it comes to looking at the translation into a contemporary form and how we appeal to the young people, we, I always try to challenge myself that how are we going to make the craft relevant and functionable to us again? And how can we adapt new technology to make this folk fashion easier to produce? And um, lastly is, should the cultural folk fashion evolve into something new which young people may appreciate better? Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. So um, one of the solutions is the social environment. We need to have a very strong social environment that allows people to appreciate our culture better. So from these uh, examples over here, you see in the present, uh, presentation, we are actually very fortunate because since I returned from Melbourne in 2004 to today, we noticed that there's various agencies, whether government or non-government, they actually come forward and try to create a social environment that allows our Pranakan culture and other cultures to be noticed and appreciated. Especially, when, um, especially in NHB, since the opening of the Pranakan Museum in 2006, we noticed that there are more Pranakan festivals, heritage trails and programs coming up. 
And this actually educates and instills interest in um, the community at large to, uh, to rediscover this intangible heritage. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see that in 2008, uh, we have these two posters of the Little Nonya drama. So this drama was actually first shown in 2008 and it sparks a lot of interest locally and overseas uh, back then. And a, and a lot of young Singaporeans start to feel that they want the culture to be part of themselves. So you will start to hear things like, oh, I'm one, one third Peranakan, I'm one sixteen Peranakan, and I want to wear the kabaya back again. And more people want to have kabaya team parties, whether it's wedding or dinner functions. And you notice that um, media like this actually created a very uh, good synergy with the efforts which has been done previously to create a living social environment. So this year, if you look at uh, China side, in 2020, they actually had the China version of the Little Nonia, and it seems to have created a trust in China. But um, because of COVID now, we see very little chances that they will actually come and appreciate the culture better in Singapore. But we actually do see uh, a lot of chi local based Chinese uh, uh, people coming to our shop to get a set of kabaya or even rent them for photo shoots and start sharing them on QQ and WeChat accounts. So it is such interest that would allow our culture to uh, perpetuate for a long, longer period. Yeah. And next. So um, when it comes to understanding and appreciating the folk fashion, uh, we need to create a need among our local people that the folk fashion actually provides them a sense of belonging and pride. And such costumes are actually taking a lot of time and affection to produce. So it is very desirable to own them. And lastly, um, these items if, uh, are often more meaningful when they are passed down as heirloom with and Mary. So, um, so how do we go about doing that? In our next slide, you'll see that um, nowadays, we notice more and more people are using kabaya as a folk fashion because it's an evergreen costume. You can never go wrong wearing a traditional kabaya uh, that represents your country. And the Nonya kabaya itself, it represented Singapore's multiculturalism really very well. So you will also see that uh, it's often used in um, overseas um, events too. And in the next slide, today, uh, when it comes to um, translating into a te contemporary form, we try to make the kabaya appealing to the young people. Because um, by doing that, we always try to uh, meet our customers, talk to them, and see what are their expectations and requirements, whether they want to wear the kabaya for a, a festive occasion or their weddings or wearing abroad, whether they need it to be very grand, with crystal stone on top. So these are the things that we always, we need to be always be sens sensitive to our clientele's um, requirements. So for example, one of the requirements that we notice for a lot of young people is that they find that kabaya needs to be very comfortable and provide them ease of movement. So that's why in this uh, series of photos here, you notice that um, the essence of the kabaya is actually the silhouette. So no matter how I try to modify the kabaya, I ensure the silhouette is still there. So when it comes to ease of movement, you notice that I've been experimenting on modern cuts, mermaid skirts, which allows better movement for our uh, younger generation customers. And likewise, we also have some customers who would often say, hey, kabaya is very warm to wear in Singapore weather. And um, I like to show off my shoulders like, like whenever I wear an evening gown. So you notice that even hotter cut versions of Nonya Kabaya, if you see right at the bottom over there, uh, you notice that um, it is one of the popular design which our customers like when they come to customize in our shop. Uh, in our next slide. So when it comes to um, designing the Kabayas, I always like to explore various other fabrics other than the voils and the organdi that most people would relate Kabayas uh, with. So I always try to encourage and uh, give new looks to the kabayas to appeal them so that they can actually wear the kabaya not just with the sarong but also with their modern wear. So for instance, uh, lace is a popular material for many designers locally and uh, abroad. 
So in the center of the presentation, you would see that um, there is a beautiful lace antique kebaya that I've taken this photo from the Pranakan Museum. You will notice that back then, the kebaya is already very elegant because it's not too colorful. And surprisingly, with that European look, in the midst of designs, you can see the Pranakan Chinese are already using lace techniques to do dragon oriental motifs onto the kebaya. So we noticed that um, um, young people today, they are actually quite into not so colorful but monotone kebayas. So you notice that on the picture on the right side, you, uh, this bride here, she's actually wearing a lace style kebaya which we have inspired and did for her. And after the wedding, this kebaya can also be used like a bolero over your, your modern wear and you can still wear it, not just for your wedding itself. And of course, um, to make the lace kebaya more interesting, um, I actually often go up to WGSN, which, which is now known as Essential. It is actually um, um, a website that actually does fashion forecasts on their next color scheme seasons. So often the case, I will always try to forecast what are the colors that's available in the market and what are the colors that is foreseen by WGSN, and I'll make them into lace kebayas. So for instance, Ko Cheng Man, she's actually wearing a lace style kebaya and most of the embroideries are mostly in lilac. And it was the color uh, in fashion back then in that year. And, and I actually match it with a dark purple sarong skirt. So this appeals to clients who are not into very colorful or overly floral clothes, but they are into modern but matching clothes. So these are the things that we have to learn to be sensitive to our clientele's needs. Next. So uh, in La Salle, um, I teach kabaya embroidery to my students and we try to encourage them that when we do embroidery, we do not just restrict them onto the kabayas. Often we try to encourage them to apply the techniques learned onto their clothes like the chong sam or their block cut clothes. And this would actually make their collection exclusive. So for instance, this is the basic chong sam but we actually add embroideries onto it that it looks like a tattoo at the back of the uh, costume over here. And next. Um, now, uh, when it comes to um, understanding the current market, we have to always adapt ourselves to what is going on around the world. Whether it and today, I actually place quite much emphasis on the technology, sustainable fashion, and collaboration with uh, people who could actually help to promote the culture. So in terms of uh, technology, in the next slide, you would see that in the past, Kabayas actually done using the treadle sewing machine, which you'll see this lady in black and white, she's actually using the single sewing machine to coordinate with her legs and hands to apply the embroideries onto the Kabaya. But nowadays, um, with technology, you can actually use um, very good quality electric sewing machines. And nowadays with the sewing machines, they have speed controls that allow us to control the speed of the sewing machine to allow students to learn the, the art of kabaya embroidery faster. And at the same time, with um, other functions like the light bulbs to, to improve clarity. And we also have things like safety mechanisms that if, um, if the sewing machine is not properly engaged, the machine will not move, but alert the user that there is um, a safety breach, which is very important because we, uh, in our today's world, we try to minimize um, uh, accidents, unnecessary accidents. And lastly, we can see that we have this machine over here, which is a computerized embroidery machine. This is something that um, my team are actually trying to experiment and see how can we use this in our current uh, kabaya making. Um, though we are still in the teething stage, but difficulties that we face would be things like um, to design an embroidery, it can take a long time. You really need experience on using the software. The machine itself is not difficult to use, but it is the designing of the software. And we noticed that um, there are very limited avenues for people like ourselves or even my students to actually explore or get people who have the knowledge to actually teach them on this area of machine embroidery, uh, embroidery using the computer. And next. So for better technology and giving our customers a 
better experience, we try to use apps like Photoshop or Procreate to aid us in the drawing and designing effectively. For, uh, for instance, in this uh, slides here, you can see we are using our color wheel and we try to calibrate to the textile color as close as possible. And then we try to apply our design onto the cloth and draw our designs and match the track colors based on what we have uh, intended for this design. And this would actually allow us to better appreciate whether the design is beautiful and it also manages the customer's uh, expectations better. Next. So sustainable fashion is something that uh, currently I'm looking into because nowadays there are many young people, um, they are into reducing pollution and going green um, as part of their um, initiative. So to appeal to the younger uh, generation uh, and being an environmentally responsible business, going sustainable is actually one of the avenues that we are actually going now. So in our next slide, I'm going to show you a piece of batik, which is a 2.5 meter batik. And you can see that usually a piece of batik, we can actually make them into a piece of short sleeve batik shirt like you see on your extreme left. And often the case when a customer wants to do a long sleeve shirt, we'll require two pieces of a similar fabric. And often the case, it's not easy to find two similar pieces. And even if we do, what do we do with the balance cloth? So often the case, we'll try to do them into sustainable fashion, like we try to match them with um, matching colored fabrics and uh, try to add textures onto the batik so that you, you personalize the, the shirt. And this shirt will be a once-off um, design, which we do, usually can't replicate anymore. Next. And a while ago, we mentioned about um, the batik cloth. If you want to do a long sleeve shirt, we require at least two meters, uh, two pieces of 2.5 meter cloth. And often the case, it is really very difficult. So what happens is we actually work very closely with our artisans, uh, artisans whereby um, we actually show them that um, batiks can be drawn in a way, like you've seen over here, you can see the dragon designs. Instead of drawing eight panels of floral designs to make a long sleeve shirt, by cutting up the segments and drawing our specific designs up there, we actually mainly do only two main panels of designs. So this actually would reduce work and time spent on making the cloth. And this cloth itself can be enough to make from small size to double XL. Whereas if we use two pieces of 2.5 meter cloth, because of the matching of the fabric, we might end up only doing a maximum up to about XL, nothing more than that because usually cutting off and when we try to match the print, it can take up quite a lot of cloth. And lastly, um, we have a lot of young people, they are inheriting a lot of old batiks from their grandparents or friends. And often these cloth are batik tulis, which is a hand-drawn cloth. And to cut the cloth is really such a waste. So nowadays, as part of our sustainable efforts, we are into making sarong cloth by not cutting them into actual skirts, but stitching them up by hand and make them into a tight skirt. So being a tight skirt will be easier for modern young girls to wear because a lot of young people do not know how to fold the sarong skirt. So this would be a perfect solution for many young people at the same time. And next. And I mentioned a while ago that kabayas are often passed down as an heirloom item. What happens if your kabaya has fabric has spoiled over the years? And we know that kabayas can take six to eight weeks to complete. So usually the case is that I will encourage young customers that, hey, bring down your kabayas. We can try to use our kabaya techniques and apply your kabaya embroideries onto a new kabaya to salvage it. And this is how we actually do it in the presentation slides. We cut out the fabric, lay it nicely into the cloth, and then we complete them into a kabaya and look as good as new over here. Next. And nowadays, when it comes, as I mentioned a while ago, that it takes six to eight weeks to complete the kabaya, we would also sometimes pre-embroider our cloth into a 2.5 meter cloth, like what you see over here, with the two lapels in front, the embroideries at the back, and two smaller embroideries for the sleeves. This would actually reduce our opportunity cost and waiting time for our customers who are waiting for their clothes to be customized. The opportunity cost is usually the situation whereby by the time we complete a costume, the customer's expectation of the clothes is not what they expect. 
is usually in terms of the color matching, especially. So by making the clothes with this cloth, uh, it makes things easier for us. And people would often say, hey, there's a wastage of cloth around the, uh, the fabric after we have making it. Often we, we would do them into uh, pocket squares by embroidering only the corner tip. Or whenever we cut out our cloth, the balance embroideries will just cut out and applique them onto um, pouches or make them into small little sustainable items like this hairband over here. So we do not try to waste every part of the fabric. And next, in this slide, in times of COVID, um, business for us is also rather breeze and everybody is actually experiencing this same problem too. So it is also a time that we actually try to reorganize and re restructure ourselves. Because um, during the period, uh, we decided to do batik masks and there was a, re a demand for reusable masks back then. So just happened so that we were upcycling all our batik remnants and this cloth can be recycled or upcycled into masks. And surprisingly, as the time goes, we start to have more customized orders whereby people say that, hey, I want um, our masks with beadwork, our mask that matches with our costumes. And this becomes a market opportunity that our, our cultural arts is not just limited to the costume. It, it can be extended far beyond into lifestyle items. And in our next slide, um, when it comes to collaborations with designers and events companies, this is a platform that as um, mentioned earlier by the previous stickers, we lack such platform. And this platform uh, actually allow us to have a greater exposure to, to promote our art further. So for example, um, you can see on your top right hand corner, you can see uh, John Lee, he's wearing a shirt that Frederick Lee has made and designed for him. And the embroideries are actually uh, designed and done by us. So this goes to show that um, collaboration can be done to create something new and different, especially the next one whereby I collaborated with a young designer, Aaron uh, Chua from the Square Bespoke, where we actually tried to combine a sustainable fashion of balanced batik cloth to make a uh, men's jacket, to make it something different and unique. And of course, when it comes to events, uh, we try to um, uh, collaborate with people locally and overseas to get better exposure and experience to how to feature our, our cultural costume out of Singapore. And one of the upcoming ones, which we are still in the midst of discussion, would be at the Espera Fashion Week, whereby it's going to be um, their first time and my first time to see how can we do a fashion show uh, on Zoom platform and within a short time period in a small screen. And this can be quite a challenge, but it's a good experience for us at the same time. Yeah. And to conclude the whole thing, um, to allow our culture to perpetuate in years to come, there's a really a social need that we try to make the costume um, unique to our consumers, that there's a sense of belonging and pride to wear them. And for our culture to move on to the next generation, and arts and craft have to evolve. And in previous uh, slides, and, in, uh, and Kirk has shown very good examples from other countries, that people are starting to evolve and create something relevant to the young generation. So we should think about how can we reinvent and make it appeal to the young people and make it relevant to them. And of course, there's one problem that we face, and that is um, cultural appropriation. So we ha I would have to recalibrate you back to the statement by Carl Sagan, that you have to understand the past to understand the present. With this statement in mind, you'll be able to appreciate the culture. But when you create something new, you won't create something that is kitsch, that may offend people, and people can't accuse you of not respecting and culturally appropriating their culture. And I hope um, this presentation would uh, interest you in this part here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Wong, for the sharing on the evolution of the Nonya Kabaya and the proactive steps that have been taken to ensure its relevance in the face of changing consumer preferences and even environmental trends such as sustainability. 
Now I would like to hear from the audience on whose job do you think plays the biggest role in safeguarding cultural heritage? A poll should be appearing on your screens now and the options are traditional craftsmen and their families and disciples, cultural and heritage communities, government agencies, consumers, or even corporate companies like your departmental stores or fashion brands. Whose role do you think can actually help to raise awareness and the preservation of these crafts? Take a vote in the poll that has been launched. Okay, I guess we can close the poll now. And we actually have quite a huge spread of responses. A majority of you feel that the culture and heritage communities are responsible for safeguarding cultural heritage, followed by government agencies, we keep that in mind, um, consumers, and then traditional craft practitioners themselves. Well, actually, there is no right or wrong answers in this because, in fact, everyone plays a huge and critical role in pres preserving our, our crafts. So next up, we will invite Mrs. Tan to come and share with us from, about Taokwang Pottery Jungle and how they have worked with various stakeholders to ensure that Singapore's last surviving dragon clean well continues to survive. Mrs. Tan, the stage is yours. Okay, I'm Yulanti Tan from the Taokwang Pottery Jungle as a second generation of running the business, family business. Okay, I'm sure that most of you didn't heard about what is the Dragon Hill. Actually, Dragon Hill have a long history about 3,000 years ago. Uh, it is originally from China. And this Dragon Hill uh, has been brought to Singapore in the earliest 30s by the immigrants from China, but mainly they are from Teochew. And there are about 20 Dragon Hill in the past in Singapore. Okay, next. Okay, this is the front part of the dragon kiln. Okay, next. Okay. My father-in-law is a feng shi born Teochew that came in Singapore earlier. And, but she, he started the dragon kiln and took over the business in 1965. And we do the small cottage industry producing the rubber cups. Rubber cup is something like this. It's something like this is for collecting the rubber set. And most of the dragon kill in the past producing this kind of the rubber cups until about 70s that we have producing the orchid pots. And in the 70s, after the 70s that we have producing the local flavor, like the gift for tourists, uh, something like this, and all the gift and from most of the kiln in the past as a small cottage industry. And due to the demands after the 80s, due to the demands decline and most of the pieces of ceramic was imported so that we need to have the competitions with the imported ceramics and we have to stop the production using the dragon kiln since late 80s. The, then we were in 2001, after the stock productions of the ceramic is in the late 80s, then we start doing the import and export. Until the 2001, we have await the dragon kiln again, but it is not used for production, but we use it for the hobbies and for the interest groups to try and experience the firing. Because of the, this decline that we have no choice, that we have moved forward to make this craft alive, we move forward to the educational, uh, that is everything that it is uh, more appropriate. And through this educational, uh, to share about the process of the ceramics making, then we coming back to introduce what is the uh, traditions and we also, through the education, we also can share with the audience, with the community, the process of the ceramic and what's the difference between the modern kiln and the traditional craft. 
and through the exhibition to the other event, the outreach to the community, then we also to share with them how to appreciate the craft, the unique craft of it, and through the effect of it. Because for most of the people that they think that the craft of the traditional uh, ceramics is very rough, like the pot pots, uh, they do not understand the effect. And for most of them, uh, they don't understand the process. So we are doing the process to show them the different way of forming it. And from this forming and also to show them the process, not just digging the clay and they make, then it can be very modern. From this modern, then we can text on the young people to participate on, uh, to learn the process from, from learning the process, then they will, we will share with them about the dragon kiln, about the tradition. So they can learn from the exhibition, they can learn also the process, uh, the effect of the, this uh, unique effect of the dragon kiln. Because some of the pieces, they fire in the dragon kiln or fire in the electric kiln, modern kiln are different. So from the pieces that fire in the electrical kiln is very constant and from firing from the dragon kiln or the traditional kiln, there is some unique pieces that you cannot achieve. So that we have from there that in 2000, we start forming Tao Guang clay artists to we gather the hobbyists and we gather the passionate people and family share how the dragon kiln works and how the techniques of it and the using of the clay so that through there then to take their interest uh, to this part of the traditional uh, craft Next. Uh, of course uh, about six years ago we have inject our new blood means that uh, our third generation coming in to help us and to promote and to make this uh, traditional craft uh, young. So we are hoping that to take on the young generations from through the workshop, they have the first hand uh, experience on it. And also we have, uh, due to the, this uh, COVID-19, then we also having the, our online workshop, on, no, online store, so that we show them about the difference of different kind of the ceramics through there that we hopefully after this pandemic they can have the first hand uh, experience and coming back come back to dragon kiln to try on their ceramics from there because ceramic is something different that we can't do by the virtual uh, hands-on as they need to feel it with the different kind of the clay but we also we plan we also do with the, our next plan we are also doing with our virtual uh, tour so that they can understand that how the dragon kiln work and how it is uh, how the whole dragon kiln the inside the dragon kiln and how the actually the dragon kiln works and the process of packing it uh, actually the whole process is about the labor of love through experience, I think that uh, they will be more understand how to sustain and to safeguard this part of the heritage. This is packing of the kiln. This is inside the kiln. So every piece of the artwork, you have to pack it uh, by hand uh, manually. And every time it's different, uh, the effect of it. Let me show you the effect. This is, we keep the tradition so that we don't lose this tradition. We keep, uh, before the firing, we need to do the praying ceremony. And we will start from the firing box. This is how it will start. Then this is a side stock hole that uh, basically that, this is inside the kiln uh, while they are firing. As we are doing the firing uh, these few years, uh, my group of the clay artists, we do some research so that we can 
have more records that to passing down to more people, more community that willing to learn and uh, to continue to keep this dragon kiln fire. It's after the firing, they have to unpack. And firing the dragon kiln is a teamwork. So you can't do it by yourself, that you have to have a big community to experience and to work together. This is the beauty of the different kind of the effect from the wood fire. So this is like a reduction firing means that this effect, it won't get the second piece as the pieces actually is green color. You can see from the green, green uh, colors at the side of the cup. Then after the reduction, the unique of it that they turn naturally uh, to pinky or to purplish. Next one. This one is more modern that people uh, to give them a, another feel that firing of the traditional art craft, it is not just the raw clay that you see like an orchid pot or the flower pot or you know, but it is you can add in some color to enhance the beauty of it and all this beauty of it is by the unique of it that you cannot get the repeated. Uh, effect from them. This is more raw and more natural because this is uh, something that uh, different from the periods that with the color. This one is a raw, raw one without the color that we have applied with the different clay. Means that uh, ceramic is not only uh, the, if the the shape or model it. But you can experience with different kind of the clay, then they will give you a different effect of it. There is a beauty of the wood fire. Same thing as this one, we do not apply any color. In fact, that we have applied a very little. And as you see from the side here, you see from this part. Yeah. This is just a very light color, natural that's colors from the wood ash. Uh, but this is a raw piece, raw clay color from different clay. And this is the raw clay. This is also raw clay. This effect is given uh, accidentally, but from the flame of fire means that it comes from the flame uh, of fire that given from the wood. Next one. And this one we have add some glaze that to have more young flavor that maybe, you know, to have more young flavor that to it can be used for the table utensil. Uh, not only the flower pot, you can have some of like pieces like uh, uh, cup that you can have. This is a cup that you know that more people would like to use. Actually, the dragon kiln in the past they are making as their livelihood as uh, their daily use item. Not only the flower pot, but right now we also do some of the plates. This is the wood firing plates that have different effect. This is also from the dragon kiln firing. And also we can do for the for this. This one is also from the wood firing. So that And also another one, this is a flower uh, for the, uh, the buses from the flower arrangement. So it is very young looks for them, you see, but it is not the vi very vibrant color because the pieces from the dragon kiln firing or from the wood tradition firing, there's a unique pieces and they look uh, everlasting. I mean, from my personal uh, opinion, uh, personal view of it. They are not uh, like very vibrant colors of it. And you, this, this is a piece that uh, we, we did it without any color, without any color apply. And it is from wood firing. And this effect is from the fire that is from the wood. There is a flashing. This is the bottom of it. You see, through, through this educational, through this process, through this knowledge, then we hope that to get the young, more young people and a young generation and to sustain also our tradition and they can be accept, uh, easier to, for them to accept it. 
This is more traditions. This this picture is more tradition that is very raw and natural. So it's quite difficult. It's not that difficult, but I mean that uh, maybe some of them do not accept this uh, very tradition. That's why we have given through these six years, we have doing a lot of research and try to have more uh, different effect and more variety that can show that we fire in the dragon kiln, the effect, the, what is a unique effect from the dragon kiln. Okay, so from, if we, we are sharing this one, this part from that, but we have to share the process from the beginning, from the process, the education then, how the process of making, so they can understand the process. Through this process, they can understand the whole uh, forming it is have to be step by step through here then we will move them forward to understand the traditional craft and the unique of it from the appreciation of these traditional craft that we hope that they can have a passing down to young and uh, young people and also to passing down the this up of the dragon kiln firing to the next level and bring the awareness of the tradition wood firing to the local community of course, that hopefully from the virtual tour that we can have the space for our tradition and culture to local and foreigner. Uh, hopefully that we also can attract more tourists to Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tan, for the sharing. I felt like I've just been brought through a journey into Tao Guang's Dragon Clean. Now we are now moving into the Q&A segment and I would like to invite Mr. Yo Kirk Xiang and Mr. Raymond Wong back to join us. So I do see some questions that are coming in through the Q&A module. So if you have any other thoughts from today's sharing, please feel free to keep your questions coming. Our first question comes from Mabel and it's actually directed at Mr. Raymond Wong, asking if Raymond, if you might be training any protégés when it comes to passing on the kabaya making craft across future generations. Okay, uh, as I mentioned previously in my slides, kabaya is actually a slow fashion. And kabaya itself, right, we actually have two main groups of people just coming together to produce one kabaya. So the first group is the pattern drafter, because the kabaya, no matter how beautiful the embroidery you can produce, if the cutting of the dress does not accentuate the wearer's beauty, then it defeats the purpose of doing so much embroidery under the clothes. So for my side, I've trained, um, I'm training my assistant to be a pattern drafter that, that can pattern draft uh, based on our customers' requirements of how long, how short, and how fitting they want their clothes to be. And this requires a lot of experience because um, you need to really appreciate the women's free-form body. Whether she's pear-shaped body or very hourglass body, it requires time and experience to, um, to do that. And um, this can, can, cannot be learned from school because usually in school, they actually use a mannequin to actually teach that, um, that uh, part. Then the other one is the machine embroidery portion. Over the years, I've trained um, a lot of students doing kabaya embroideries. The aim is... We hope one day these students may want to perpetuate the culture and do kabayas. But the thing is, if they don't do kabaya, then what happened to the craft? So we do hope that with this knowledge base, they can actually try to create their own new creation that can be a new Singapore good design, not just in the form of kabaya. And of course, for our side, um, we are doing traditional kabayas. I try to train with that knowledge that I have. It doesn't mean that I have to do the kabayas on my own. In other words, I can also import foreign workers and train them how to do the buyers which are more affordable for our general public. So in other words, the information itself is very important. We need to know that know-how first before we go on to do any designs or managing the, the process itself. Yeah, and that's my answer for this question here. Mm, thank you. Thanks for that insightful response. Oh, now we have a question from Daniel and he asks about how or what does the National Heritage Board consider as cultural appropriation? Um, Kirk Xiao, would you like to take this question? Yes, thank you, uh, Daniel. And I also see another question uh, by Johnny, which is also talking about cultural appropriation and uh, 
so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll take both questions um, together. So I think firstly to, to Daniel's question, what is uh, what we consider as cultural appropriation? So I think at NHB we don't have a definition, but I think by and large, I think what people will, I think the, the perception of cultural appropriation is when one majority group, say a majority race, um, borrows uh, a culture, which is could be the culture from the food, um, dressing, fashion, uh, or craft, and so-called borrows elements and uses it, borrows elements from a minority group and uses it without the consent of um, the group or an individual. Uh, and that creates the perception that it's problematic because it's seen as um, a dominant group, you know, taking from a smaller minority group. Uh, and, and there's a lot of emotional response to, to some of these incidents. And I think the, the incident that Johnny mentioned about the food and the local case is, is very true. It created a, a, a response, a emotional response from people. And understandably so, because uh, culture is something very true and very deep, uh, deep entwined to our identity. I, I don't have a simple, straightforward answer how do we deal with it. Because the same case is viewed very differently from, from the lens of different people. Uh, so there was one case, I, I will use a, a case from the America, uh, based, um, since we're on the topic of fashion, right? So there was, I remember reading a case where a young a white American girl wore a chong sam to a prom dinner. And that triggered, I think, of course, taking a lot of photos, put on social media, it triggered a lot of uh, negative response. People, uh, especially from Asian Americans to say, hey, that's my culture, why are you wearing it? You know, but then the same, same, same photos went to China and they, a lot of people were saying, oh, it's good. It's like people actually appreciate our culture, not just uh, within us. So the same incident, because of your, your own personal um, environment can trigger very different responses. And I think the only way, I think, I guess one way to deal with it is how do you, um, treat, treat um, you know, it with respect. Because at one point, we don't want it to be very purist that, oh, this culture can only stay within this, 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 uh, you know, this group. Like the Kabaya, I think is enjoyed by people from different ethnic groups, um, Singaporeans and non-Singaporeans. It would be a shame if we put this wall around our, our culture and say, this is mine and, and don't touch it. Um, but we need to do so respectfully uh, and you know, listening, uh, thinking about you know how 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 would it how would the minority group response? Often, I guess, especially for for for, for majority groups, we, we might not think so much about some of these issues. But I think we, we take a step back sometimes, especially if we are looking at at culture design and all that. We might need to take a step back and see how do we respectfully deal with it. How do we perhaps talk to someone uh, who was involved in the field or re who understands the culture? before we embark on some of these uh, efforts to try to change, modernize, uh, adapt design and so on. So that's uh, my take on the issue of culture appropriation. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk Siang. Yes, indeed, culture is something that is very close to our hearts and perhaps might require some careful navigation. So our next question is actually for Mrs. Tan. Uh, Mrs. Tan, um, the question is about how do you work with or foresee working with modern practitioners like home-based potters or home-based designers? Mrs. Tan, would you like to take this question? You can do uh, yes, I think so. Uh, it's a good question. I think um, before, um, I would see that uh, for those potters uh, in experience for the wood firing or the designer, I think it is the best way that they can experience with us uh, on our firing so they can experience the process and also that they can experience the material use before they design something because uh, clay, they have a lot of different types of the clay that you, it is not suitable for type, uh, type A, but it is suitable for design on the type B. So this is very important when they design or the potters that experience potters 
because a lot of uh, some of the potters they don't experience on the wood firing, but they experience on the other part. You see, so from there that we can share, we have no problem to share with them and to, or to contribute to collaborate with them for that part. You know, so I think that it's the best that they can come and experience with us what is the firing, so they can understand the effect of it and through. Uh, corroborate with them, we, they can contribute their design, mm. their forming, so whether it is suitable for wood fired. And uh, different, I, I'm very concerned about the material that they use to fire in the dragon kiln because the material, the clay that is used for the best effect, what is the best effect that can uh, use it for firing in the dragon kiln. They will be different from the um, modern kiln. Okay, right. So our next question is actually open to all three speakers. It's about what kind of design collaborations do you actually hope to see arising from today's sharing? Is there a sort of dream project that you would like to embark on in the future that is perhaps multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary types of collaborations? Mm, hi, I think I'll start first. <laughs> um, personally, I feel that um, there's a lot of uh, design collaborations that can be actually explored. Um, ever since the co exhibition by NHB last year, it actually opened um, a lot of people's eyes, including myself, that cultural culture can inspire people and it can be beautiful. And if you understand the history well and you re recreate the culture into a new form, it actually is wonderful that the culture is really impressing, our culture is impressing other people outside of our country. And this is the kind of collaboration I think um, young students need to be exposed because they don't see the valuable um, ICH of our collection in the museum or in our culture itself. For me, I, I don't have a dream project. I would say anything that, you know, if, if we can marry some of the design, one design with, with a traditional craft, I, I would, it would be a dream come true. It doesn't, I'm not looking at a specific form. So I, I was very, like I mentioned sharing this, I was actually very inspired when, when during my holidays or, or past work trips, I had a chance to visit other countries like Korea and Japan. I also saw uh, the, the civil servants there telling me you know, how they have tried to convert uh, and pair up the designers. So if we could do something similar uh, with, with some of our, our local craftsmen, that would be, uh, I think, a good success for us. Thank you. Uh, I think it is uh, good for corroborations, like, you know, uh, like what I agree with Kassian, that you have to uh, work together with it. See, to come up with, uh, it's not the design, but it is the experience of it. Great, thank you for your response. Um, our next question is actually for Kaohsiung, and it's asking if the National Heritage Board is already working with craftsmen to translate this craft to a contemporary audience. I guess it's a bit similar to the previous question on collaborations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say, I think at the National Heritage Board, with a lot of our past efforts have been trying to see how we can offer a platform for our traditional practitioners, our craftsmen, um, to be a sort of, um, to raise the awareness, general awareness level. So we, we do involve them in programming, in, for example, our, our annual um, Singapore Heritage Festival. But I think we honestly have not tried to do something like a really focusing on design. So I think this is some one area that I think we are trying to work towards. We, like I mentioned, we started off giving awards to try to recognize individuals. I think this is another area I think hopefully we will try to focus more attention uh, going forward. Yeah, so um, that's my short answer to this question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are coming near to the end of the Q&A session, so we'll be taking two more questions just to wrap things up. Um, our next question comes from Wendy. So Wendy is asking whether, um, it's open to all, so Wendy is asking whether you see any difference between craft knowledge for artistic expression or craft knowledge for industrial production. 
uh, I'll, I'll take this answer. Since, since um, you mentioned about Japan, I will give a Japanese example. Um, so several years ago, I was in Japan. I, I, I happened to bump into this very interesting shop selling chopsticks. So then I, I noticed that the chopsticks cost a few hundred to a thousand over US dollars per pair. So I started looking at, you know, they had a storyboard talking about the history of the shop. So it used to be manufacturing chopsticks in, in large quantities. But of course, um, chopsticks uh, manufacturing is no longer uh, profitable to make by hand, right? Because it's like mass-produced, industrial, uh, disposable kind of wear. So what the shop actually did was to go into creating more artisanal products. So like this, so, so they, they talk about you know, how, how, how they create more literally paint artwork on the chopsticks, the lacquer, the quality. So those are still made by hand. So I think it has evolved from uh, the shop, for example, has evolved from uh, industrial production, but in order to survive and still pr protect its artisanal traits, it had to evolve into, I think, a more artisanal route. So I wouldn't say they are mutually exclusive, but I will use a term like evolving, like this is living heritage. So it evolves with the times, and, and, and somebody probably in their shop decided to innovate, reach out to a new audience in order to stay alive, and they have um, created that. I think many examples in Singapore also. I think maybe Mrs. Tan, you want to share a bit also? I mean, you were involved in production of pottery, right? But now also looking at a lot of these artisanal products. Yes, yes. So I unmute first. I think that um, it's very clearly, you know, the craft knowledge of artistic expressions of wood farming or the knowledge of for the production because the pieces that if for the production, for the industrial production, these pieces as the wood farming, every piece is different. There is a unique of it. So it is not the production's means, you know what I mean? It is not the productions uh, in the mass production type, but uh, the people have to understand that the pieces is the artistic piece, but there is a unique piece, not the mass production. There is a difference in between these two, what I, I want to express to them. So, uh, I can't say that it, because of production, mass production, that I can say expression is, diff, is, is different. But of course, like uh, making the plates, but how far that uh, people that can appreciate that they are using this artistic plates than the mass production plates. Right. Understand. Okay, so the last question for this evening is actually a quick, maybe a quick sentence or response from all three, of, all three speakers. Um, the question asks, what is the richest part of Singapore's culture to you? So what makes Singapore's culture so special in other words? Um, for myself, I think it's the multiculturalism. And Pranakan culture itself is a very good example of a Nanyang culture that we have started to assimilate various interesting cultures from other races and repackage and give it a new look that reflects our lifestyle over here. So personally, I feel it is the multiculturalism that uh, makes Singapore culture very, very unique and interesting. Yeah, actually for me, it's also multiculturalism, but maybe just to add on and expand the, the discussion is also, I hope there's a certain openness to people to, to try to appreciate and value the culture that is from the others as well. That, I think, is what makes uh, our multiculturalism so special, the respect value that we accord to others. Thank you. Mrs. Tan, would you like to add anything? Uh, yes, I think uh, because uh, Singapore is multicultural, but I think uh, ceramics, uh, you know, uh, although that uh, it is that uh, was brought in from the immigrant from China, but I think that the form that used that uh, any uh, any races or anybody that can 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 shape on their own, so become the become the unique of their different cultural pieces that to be fired in the uh, wood kill, but uh, but more concern is about the effect. But uh, through, through the effect of the wood fire, the artistic effect, then they add to the value of different culture. Right. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you so much, our panelists, for the engaging discussion today. So I think it really gives us a quick sense and reconnect back to our roots and also a deeper appreciation for our cultural roots and what it means to be a Singaporean. Um, to all attendees, we hope that this session has inspired you on the preservation of local crafts and even spark thoughts on how you can play a part to safeguard our local culture and heritage. Now designers, if you are inspired by this sharing to research into new design projects around cultural identity, the Good Design Research Initiative is for you. In fact, an open call will be launched in October and we welcome your ideas on design impact driven projects. Um, on this note, I'd like to invite my colleague Hui Mei back to give us a quick sharing on the open call and some of our upcoming events. Thanks, Jerrica. So for those of you who are keen on design impact projects and are seeking for inspirations and suitable project partners, we hope that this series of engagement and sharing sessions will be meaningful for you. Um, so in this slide, you will see the schedule for upcoming events on designing for inclusivity uh, that leads up to our second open call in October. If you would like to receive the latest updates for these activities, do share with us your email address in our post-event survey and we hope to see some of your submissions this October. So on more details of the open call, um, for the support for the selected projects, we will actually be supporting them with a cash sponsorship uh, up to, for their projects up to the proof of concept stage, as well as supporting them with publicity and mentorship. And if you would like to submit a proposal, these are the three criteria that we will be looking out for in your submissions. So first, we are keen to know your long-term plans for the project beyond the proof of concept stage. The intent is to ensure that our applicants are committed to the project. And secondly, we will be looking out for submissions that explores deep research that addresses global issues and which goes beyond the standard user research. Lastly, We'll be also looking out for projects that are clear in how it strengthens the applicant's unique value proposition. If you are keen to submit for the upcoming open call, do express your interest also in the post-event survey and we will share your and, and do share with us your email contact to receive the latest updates. With this, I'll pass the time back to Jerrica. Thank you, Hui Mei. Now, attendees, I hope you have enjoyed today's webinar. Should you wish to revisit today's discussion, a summary of the keynotes will be shared with you via email, along with the relevant links on how you can reach out and find out more about our various speakers. On the screen now will be two QR codes. Um, the leftmost one will be a quick post um, event survey, and we'd like to hear more about your feedback. The post event survey can also be found um, in the Zoom chat. And if you'd like to find out more programs that the National Design Centre has lined up under the theme of Singapore, our home, you can scan the QR code that's on the right. Um, please join me also in thanking our speakers, Kirk Siang, Raymond and Mrs Tan today for the wonderful sharing. And to all attendees, we hope that you have found the session inspiring and meaningful. We hope to see you soon at the next event and even your submissions under the Good Design Research Open Call. Thank you.